A few years ago, I came up with the concept of creative, I say I came up with the concept of creative cribs, it's just a blatant steal of MTV cribs. And we used to do them guerrilla style. So I remember Stanley did one with John Powell, I did one with Daniel Pemberton, did one with my brother. We made some posher ones for the journal and uh, still making really good stuff for Composer, but I thought it'd be fun to return to our slightly guerrilla roots to have a really special creative crib. Welcome to the bullpen. Hello, mate. The bullpen. <laughs> the Welcome. I'm really keen that you, when you kind of introduce yourself on videos that you go live from the bullpen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is insane, mate. Oh, come on in, come on in. So how many square, is it square feet that we do things by? Ooh, or that's a good... Meters? I'm, yeah, it's metres. I think it's 17 by 11 or something like that. Wow. Um, meters. So yeah, it's uh, it's uh, I've got a little bit more ground space um, because we've got a cat slide, what they call a cat slide, which is a you know a little kind of extension of the the roof. So the main building is about you know goes up to roughly where the wall comes in there, and then this li this little extra bit here is just gives you a bit more floor space. It's so. absolutely stunning, and you have I mean linked. Below is uh, you actually make it, because it's literally from the, the ground up. From the ground up. So what was here was a, a very ugly agricultural barn. It was a breeze block construction, uh, but had an asbestos roof and all of that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. And so um, we got permission to get rid of that and replace it with something which is a lot more, it's certainly a lot nicer for our neighbors to look at. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and just is a bit more in keeping with the kind of Cotswold uh, vernacular of you know those lovely kind of stones and yeah. all of that kind of stuff so yeah it's been and it's taken just over a year from uh, start of construction properly floated and ah well that's interesting so it w the way that we did the construction was that um, there is so much concrete so the, there's the concrete that forms the basic basic floor here um, which has then been screeded over once we would put the routing in for all the cables and everything um, what's above here is called block and beam. So they're again, huge kind of concrete beams that are just kind of, um, you know, laid over uh, the, the structure to kind of put the roof on. And then the wall thickness is basically, uh, you have a, a breeze plot construction and then uh, you have an insulation gap. Um, and then you have an outer wall, which is what you see when you look at a Cotswold stone building. Okay. And then we've actually got, again, inside, <laughs> we've got another Cotswold stone wall on either side, uh, which we just built inside. It was, that was a funny thing because we, we kind of said, um, I looked at so many stone facings, those kind of, uh, you know, syn kind of fake synthetic things, because I wanted, I wanted to have a feel for, of the Cotswolds inside. Um, and we got to a point where they, we just thought they all looked rubbish. So the builder said, well, I could actually just build an actual Cotswold stone wall inside. So, right. so that's an extra layer of insulation as well. Um, and then we've got tons and tons of sound uh, absorbing various different membranes and, and rock wool and all kinds of stuff behind the fabric here. So there's, it doesn't need to be floated because the building itself is so solid. Yeah. The points of weakness are the, obviously the windows and the door. Um, and those are kind of triple glazed, got super thick, solid doors. Um, so everything, so when you actually sit in here um, with the door to the machine room closed as well, it's just silent. You can just hear the air conditioning sort of, you know, breezing away. Amazing, yeah. absolutely amazing. And I think I love these beams. So I kind of, I thought it would it'd be nice to have um, a couple of beams to, to make it look like an oak frame building. Um, I'm happily taking uh, credit for a lot of these design things, which is pro probably actually my wife, Hannah, who came up with that idea initially. But I remember the conversation with the builder and saying, let's, can we get something that you can kind of box, you know, and it, it'll look fantastic and, you know, but it, but, uh, and then it, we forgot about it for a while and then uh, the beams turned up and they weren't, they were actual beams. I mean, enormous, enormous heavy beams that have been uh, air dried. So they are fantastically beautiful, uh, but a little bit overkill maybe. <laughs> I, don't, oh, I don't know, I think they're absolutely stunning, absolutely stunning. 
Should we start from your machine room? So things are, are still kind of in a slight state of... Is it of... these things that are wearing away? Yes. They're noisy buggers, aren't they? They are, yeah. So these are the Blackmagic uh, video recorders for Which is the... something you and I have both adopted. Yeah. Uh, they're really great. I mean, they're solid bits of kit, but they Why do... Why have we adopted yeah. those? Is it, was it for <laughs> mental health reasons? Yeah. So many times of having uh, one camera go down in the middle of a... You know, when you're shooting a one-hour-long video or something. Um, and particularly screen, the screen is the is the is the horrific yes. Thing. So trying to run ScreenFlow at the same time as as maybe running Pro Tools and Logic as well. Um, whereas with these, you take a you know a feed out from the screen and it's recorded on a separate unit. So none of that processing goes you know takes up processing power of the of the main machine. And if well, and the most important thing is if if the, if your main machine goes down, you haven't lost. Yes, because that's what would happen. Is yeah. Yeah. You know, when you're really starting to add on the, the plugins, that you yeah. just get it, get, get something. Suddenly crash or something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So so anything that's kind of noisy goes in here. Um, so the brain from the uh, M7, the brain from the TC6000, and, and those black magics, that's kind of it, really. Those are the noisy bits of gear in the studio. And then around here, I've kind of got... Uh, I've, I'm starting to find a, a way of sorting stuff so that I can find things really easily. This, this is fantastic. I love this, um, you know, built-in shelving uh, that the guys did for me. So it's tea kind and of... coffee area. Yeah, tea and coffee area. So, so I've got a little fridge behind here. Hey, wow. Blue. <laughs> so that's quite cool. Lou in here, which has got... It's oh, cool. great. It's all the little things like that. Like you, you walk in and it turns the light on and off for you. And, um, energy saving tips. Uh, so yeah, so that, so mics and all that kind of stuff. So once I've got this out the way, it should be fairly ergonomic. Amazing. You've had this purposely built, and you've, yes, I mean as, as as detailed again, video down below. You've had many kind of different iterations of studios and stuff. So uh, I imagine yeah. this has been a kind of kaizen development. Over it has. Years. Yeah, I've gone from. Yeah, I've done all kinds of different things. I remember uh, one studio that I had in a in a spare bedroom in Watford. I had a desk with just the computers and stuff. I had racks on this side and I had my keyboard on that side. So for quite a long time, I worked like that, where I would set a track recording, turn around and play, and then go back to it like that. And I, I'd... Um, I'd experimented with, with trying to have the keyboard. This The eternal dilemma is... How do you have the keyboard in front of you and your computer in front of you um, and have it work without yeah. kind of getting terrible back strain? And for me, the way that it works is that I, I have the um, keyboard set to kind of a piano level. So a little bit low, actually, like that. So, um, you know, I've got this angle on my mm. arms so that, you, so that that's good for your back as well. So I can be playing like that. It's not too far to reach to, to do things and sometimes I just pull the mouse a little bit closer so I'm not reaching too far. Once I've finished with that, I push that in and then I can get right under here and rest my forearms on the desk or just depending on how, you know, whether I'm kind of feeling more upright, I can be like this. I can, you know, it's nice and easy to kind of get get the perfect position so that you feel like there isn't too much strain on your shoulders. Everything is kind of within reasonably easy reach. So I'm in this kind of sweet spot for the speakers here so I can hear what I'm doing when I'm mixing. And I've got my mic set up for doing, you know, tutorials. walkthroughs, tutorials. And it's an iMac Pro. iMac Pro. Which you're happy with? Yeah, absolutely. It's just, you know, it, anything you throw at it is, uh, it doesn't ever kind of fall, fall over really. It's, um, These creative cribs always cost me money. You've got a bigger stream deck than me. <laughs> Excel. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't actually programmed it all up yet. So I, I really do use mine like massively. You know? yeah. yeah. I've got little things like having Wii transfer, just those little yes. quality yeah. of life stuff. So this is your... This is my monitor controller. So um, I can do... I, I've got a variety of inputs here. So I'm running digital input from the Apollos. I've got the UA Apollos down here. And that, those go digital into here. And then that just goes to the barefoots. Um, but I can plug in, you know, I've got a pair of uh, Genelex as well that I can plug in if I want to get a different sound. How long have you been a barefoot user? Probably about three years now, just over and three really years. Like I really do. They were 
not the easiest speakers to switch to because I, I was using um, Dyn Audios before. Mm -hmm. And I've come from that kind of Dyn Audio and Genelex, the 1031s uh, I used for a long, long time. They've got that kind of smiley face thing going on, which makes everything sound kind of great. And you turn them up and it's, you know, it all sounds brilliant. These are much less forgiving. They're much, much uh, cleaner. And so you have to work slightly harder to make it sound good. But I've found that the stuff that I do on here um, translates, you know, to other kind oh, of good. other speakers much um, much better than than the stuff that I was doing on the other the other ones before. And both the TC6000 and uh, Brocasti, do you feel they have different applications? I love the large warm hall on the TC6000 and I also like some of the plates on here. So the ones that I've got up at the moment, the silky gold plates is really great. Um, it's got a great cathedral as well. I've not been using this long enough to know where it's going to replace it but i do like the boston hall on this so um i think it's just a case of kind of switching them in and out um and just seeing you know where thing where things shine through it really i feel like i know this one so well yeah uh that, that at the moment this is kind of struggling to you know um, the tc6000 is the the one that you just hear on movie Yes. Soundtrack. So it's just yeah. there's a familiarity whether it's better or not. Exactly. Yeah. So the the two obviously the two big sounds are the Lexicon sound and the TC sound. But it's interesting because it, you know you can you can kind of rack them up. I think uh, Alan Myerson's got six of them or something like that. So you can make you can kind of modularize this into uh, the equivalent of a TC six thousand quite easily. Right. Um, I mean, obviously the main difference with the TC six thousand TC six thousand is five point one, whereas this is stereo yes which leads me on to my next question which is i don't see a 5.1 surround <laughs> no. i mean I, I i used to write in 5.1 but it's just not simply unless i'm doing computer games it's not being asked of me at all now no and you know it's really interesting because i i love you know so when we we obviously have run stuff in 5.1 at, at spitfire at the studio at spitfire and um putting stuff up and sticking the ambience out the back or you know just kind of hearing things in surround is really exciting and it does sound it does it make you excited it's fun but the but for me the thing is that kind of um you have to concentrate so hard to get things sounding good at the front right and i think that you can be tricked into thinking that it's all good because you're hearing this lovely enveloping sound it's not really, the problem comes when you have to switch it off to deliver stuff. So if you're delivering a TV score that they don't want surround, um, then it's a problem because if you write in surround and then, you, and then you try and collapse it down to stereo, it doesn't always go easily. One of the problems I found with having a 5.1 set up, set up all the time is it tend to get in, in the way of things. So having a centre speaker got in the way of your 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 screen and you were yeah. making kind of compromises there, yeah. your kind of working arrangement because you needed six speakers. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, and I think um, I think if there was a specific project, I could quite easily just set up a couple of speakers here and, you know, get a, a middle. Yeah. You know, the, the other thing is that you don't, it, it's not absolutely necessary to have the same speakers all around because that, these were eye-wateringly expensive <laughs> more than yes. I wouldn't want to have to buy another three, put it that way. So I think- But also, um, I mean, you don't, you don't really put much in the center speaker. No. So you could quite easily have a pair of BM5As. Yes, to give you a good, exactly. And enough. then, yeah, and it would still be fine. So I'm just, I'm gonna wait and see with that. But I, I think um, I, didn't want to, I didn't want to default to that because I felt that ergonomically it would be taking space and, uh, you know, away from kind of what I really wanted, what I feel is more important to my kind of writing process. So. Um, so you've got outboard here, here and here. Obviously yeah. you've built this from scratch. So is it safe to say that this is stuff that you need to get your hands on or keep an eye on more? Yeah, it's, um, it's things that, they, well, there's a, there's a certain amount of that. So my master chain is over here. Um, and this is, these are the things that I will generally be using on the, on the master channel. Um, it'll be either the API or the Manly. I love this compressor. I had um, 
uh, varying you, manly varying you for quite a while, and that was great as well. But I just suddenly, at some point, I started using this. It's a, it's the G series um, compre- master bus compressor from the from, from the G series desk, and I ju- it became part of my workflow more easily than the varying you. I found that I was able to make things sound better with this more consistently. So um, I really love that. And then the Overstayer MAS is something that I kind of picked up from Greg Wells. Um, And it's one of those mysterious boxes where you're not kind of a hundred, it's kind of about harmonic distortion and all that kind of stuff. You're not entirely sure what's going on. There's some kind of voodoo going on behind the scenes. But it just, you know, just kind of tweaking it a little bit and, and adding a little bit of colouring from this just makes stuff sound a little bit more lively. Um, so it's a great little one to pop, pop on the end. And then usually when I go back in, um, I'm just, I'm that kind of caveman who still loves the L2, the Waves L2. Oh yeah. So Sauce, I always have a- The sausagerizer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, don't, I never slam stuff through it. I no, just, no, no, I just, just have a, a little tickle. And what's your mother keyboard? Ah, so. This is Ooh. Physis K4. I've had this probably for about a year, I think, is it? Something like that. Um, and I was always a uh, Derpfer, uh, but I had two problems with the Derpfer. The, I was constantly uh, having problems with the MIDI, uh, the USB, um, which would just come and go all the time. I don't know where I was just unlucky and I had, because I've had two of them. Um, and they've both kind of had similar problems. The other thing was um, with the Dirt Fuzz that there, there is a thing about the black keys where to get the, the, the feel even across the keyboard velocity wise, there's a thing where you limit the upper reach of the, of the black keys. And so that has a weird effect that if you want to hammer, let's say there's this particular sound that only happens on like one, two, six or whatever, mm-hmm. one, two, seven. Um, when you hammer it really hard, nothing happens. So for some reason, I don't know. I don't know what it is, um, but I found that I don't have that problem here um, and that's on this keyboard. Through, really, you work with Spitfire, really. Yeah, absolutely. I want to know that that I, you know, for for whatever my kind of technique, I know what my, the level of my technique, um, and so I want to know that I'm feeling a kind of even response across the keyboard. And for me, this has just worked better. It's it gives me a more even response, and this is just fantastic. I mean, these, these things are great and you basically, you program them in, you can name everything. So expression, mod wheel, viv, yes, tightness, speed, CTAO, and you can just, you know, there's so many programmable functions in there. It's absolutely brilliant. Oh, Santa's list is getting bigger for me. <laughs> Black Magic Docs, we like them. Yeah. They're a bit wibbly wobbly though, aren't they? The first time I got one, I really wanted it to feel a lot more. A lot more solid, yeah. yeah. No, it's a bit weird. Yeah, you can slide it in and think that you've you've kind of you, the the drive is is docked, and it actually isn't. It's kind of wedged underneath. <laughs> so yeah. And SE1X is do you use that as your underbase? Yes, although, well, that, that's always been my one of choice. Um, it was the first one that I had. Should we explain to someone who might not know? I mean, underbase is like something yeah. we've coined, but, but what yeah. do we mean by that? Just, just to put, just to lay in at the bottom, uh, you know, kind of with the bases or an octave below the bases to- Chalos and bases, yeah. Kind yeah, of that, to the, give the them screen. that kind of- And it's know, kind of a sine wave. Sine wavey but welly. But audible sine wave, isn't it? So that's the, the yeah. thing with, the, it's, it doesn't completely disappear. Yeah, exactly. So this has got, that's got two great sounds. It does the, it does the bass. It's got really big, fat bass end. Um, and then it also does that great kind of uh, mono synth uh, high, you know, kind of funk thing yep. that that's really good as well. So it, I, it's it's kind of a copy of <laughs> one of these over here. This is great. That's a newer, newish Moog, which is um, actually even that's been superseded now by something. Else. I think it's. Um, sub 37 or something yeah. like that is a kind of newer version of that. But again, that's like, it's just fat. Uh, it's got, it's, th- I love the fact that the filter knob is so big. Cause yes. you can, and actually you can control, I've done passes where I've been doing stuff and moving all of these knobs at the same time. Um, 
and you know you just get some interesting sounds out of it. Model D. Is that a new one? No, it's it's about the same age as me, um, and that I bought. I'd have you know, wanted one for many, many, many years, and got the opportunity to buy that from a guy who was actually servicing one of my other synths, this one. So that has not been on any jobs yet, but I've been playing with it a lot and it's, you know, it's a mini moog. I mean, it sounds incredible. You liking DFAM? DFAM, again, I've kind of... Um, it's there. It's there. Waiting to be... Waiting to be, you know, put into service. And I've played with it a little bit, but I don't really feel... You can see... <laughs> I don't, I don't really feel that I've got the, got the measure of it yet. So, uh, so, yeah. This is the Odyssey, the kind of new Behringer version of the Odyssey. Um, linked below. Linked it's below, a film, I did a little film, film on that. Little film. Um, and again, I've only just got that. It only just came out, uh, you know, a month ago or something. So I haven't used that on anything yet. But I love the fact that I can make interesting sounds on it. And I can, I can under, because of all the controls, I can understand how it, how it works. Um, nice and easy. This one, uh, I don't really understand how it works, <laughs> but if you turn enough knobs and make, uh, um, you know, and push enough switches, you get mad, mad sounds out of it. So that's, I love that, but it's a little bit more of an acquired taste. This is to remind me that I do own a JX3P. It's one um, of my favourites, and I'm very jealous that you have the <laughs> Yeah, editor. but it, it's, it's in hospital at the moment, so... Um, is it? Yeah. I'm uh, very sad. It's it's got one of its voices is um, damaged, and they they've been trying for months to work out what's wrong with it, and they can't. So I'm hoping to get that back eventually. This uh, lovely machine is like a kind of um, modern Jupiter. Oh, it's um, a new thing. It's a yeah, it's newish. I think there's been a version of it out for for a while. This is the version two, Jupiter eighty. Is this and the it, one that has an eight oh eight inside it? Um, Oh, that that's a good question. I'm not 100% sure about that. It's designed to be like the next, like the modern, ad, like next one on from the Jupiter 8, I think. Okay. That's the kind of theory. It does those giant, you know, fat, thick pads. Um, but you can also kind of go into it and it's got a lot of the really lovely, very Roland-like sounds, sure. warm, thick, you know, um, strings and pads and things like that. So. That's lovely. That's a little bit more of a kind of, you know, uh, kind of thumb through the presets and find something that's kind of close and then mess around with it a bit to make it more interesting. So, um, so that's, that's really lovely. Um, this I have not had working for a while because I lost, in one of my moves, I lost the um, power lead, <laughs> annoyingly. But I've ordered one on eBay and uh, it's, I think it turned up. It's somewhere around, so, but I haven't got around to it. It's complicated by the fact that it's, um, it takes a weird kind of non-standard oh, plug on the end and also it's US voltage. So I have to be very careful that I don't break it when I plug it in. So I've got my, my voltage converter there waiting, ready to go. But that's got some great sounds in I, as well. I remember that mm. from back in the day. Yeah. And these pedal boards. Yes, so this is great. I really love the sound of this. It's um, it has the, also the benefit that you can load cabinet emulations into it. So there's a whole aftermarket of people who make mic and cabinets kind of you know um, uh, what they called impulse responses. Um, so that, that's really great. It's, it's got some amazing uh, recreations of old stomp boxes and stuff like that in, and it's very very easy to program your own patches as well. So these, both of my pedal boards I've got on looms so I can easily drag it out to the middle um, and, you know, kind of sit at the workstation and play um, while I'm messing around with it. Um, so that's the kind of, that's a kind of all in one thing that does a certain thing really well. And then here I've got my, my actual pedal collection. So a few of the Mooga Fugas, the, Fantastic stuff from Strymon. Yeah. Um, and then the Eventide H9, it's got some really, really great sounds in. Fantastic harmonised stuff. Oh, and that, and that, actually, this is quite interesting. So this is something that I'm, that I'm just in the process of getting my head around. It was designed by Justin at Studio Creations. Um, and that is, the, that is an, an effect switching system. So I can 
between the two of these, I can patch effects in and out, but also I can take any synth and run it through any combination of the guitar effects. Oh. And it, yeah, and so stuff is malted on the patch bay. So basically I can just go, I can just go straight into my uh, Apollos if I want to just record the output of the synth, but I can also get creative and mess around with, you know, with some knobs and stuff and, and make a weird sound as well, uh, very, very easily. Um, but as I say, I'm, that's a, I'm still learning it at the moment. I'm not 100% there with exactly how I'm, how I'm going to use that in my workflow. Very nice. And, uh, you know, how involved did you get in the um, design of the patch bay? Because for anyone who does, hasn't mm. owned a patch bay, it's incredibly involved, isn't it? Yeah. So I've, this is my third patch bay. Um, so I've made a few mistakes before and also realised that there are some kind of standard ways of laying out a patch bay that don't work for me. Um, so this was a, a very much a kind of collaboration. It was a backwards and forwards. Um, you know, I had a rough idea for the first thing, which I just drew on a piece mm -hmm. of A4, sent that over to Justin. He started planning it and he would send me back things saying, right, I've, I've put this in here. Um, what about doing it like this? And at one stage we were going to, um, there was going to be another unit under here with big, uh, those big, um, like the, the multi-track, you know, things. I can't remember what they're called. I think they're called E. Dex. Yeah, they're not the EDAX, they're the other one. They look very much like EDAX, but they're slightly different. But, the, but whether you could patch all of the inputs across to the inputs of the tape deck or all of the outputs from the tape deck into the... And it got too complicated. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what am I trying to do here? I'm trying to save myself from putting in, let's say, you know, I mean, how many things am I going to be running onto tape at the same time? Maximum of 16. Because, because I'm using the 16 track head. So it's 16 patch chords, worst case scenario. So I thought, right, I'm gonna lay it out so that the tape gets patched in and out of the system, as opposed to trying to make it so that the system is constantly kind of wired through okay, by I default. See. So that, um, the, the other thing was this, was the 8816, which I bought secondhand um, from the lovely guys Essex Pro. And they had, um, they had this in stock and it's not been massively heavily used. Um, and I just wanted to try, I've always had an idea about how I would use a summing mixer. And I bought um, a, a kind of a, a DIY summing mixer that had been made by a guy, a friend of a friend, out of Neve components, supposedly. Um, and I, I quite liked that and it worked, it was a little bit scratchy, it was kind of, you know, like, a, like the scratchiest desk you've ever used. <laughs> but actually, you know, once you got rid of the crackles, um, it did add a certain something, just putting stuff through it. So I thought I'm going to start using this and as you can see I've, I've been experimenting with it already and see what, how it works for me. And I'm not using the width uh, thingy or anything like that, I'm just basically putting stuff through it to see what it adds and it and it does i'm a huge believer in in putting stuff out of the computer through analog gear even if it's not doing much it's adding something that we're we're used to the sound of that kind of harmonic distortion or whatever the the kind of components bring to the sound not necessarily how it makes you, how it sounds how it make, makes you feel yeah there's I mean, a huge amount of that yeah I mean, certainly when I bought my first, I don't know if you have one, but I, when I first bought my first Neve Mic Pre, yeah. <laughs> um, I just, I just, I, I couldn't hear the difference, but I just remarked how I didn't need to mix. It wasn't as hard to mix. You know, I was doing yeah. some vocals and suddenly I wasn't like having to ride it and have to put stack loads of plugins on it. Just, it felt yeah. like it sat better. It sounded more like music. Yeah. It's a funny thing. The first thing I bought was, um, <laughs> was a Focusrite Red Mic Pre. And it just had four Mic Pre's on it and it didn't really do anything else. But, and I remember I used it for about six months just putting everything through it. And I knew that I wanted to get something else uh, because I wanted something which had a compressor and an EQ in. And I really struggled parting with that because I couldn't afford that to keep that and get something else at the same time. And when, I, when I'd lost it, I really, really missed it. Really? Because 
everything that you put through it just sounded so good. It, it sounds ridiculous and people, I'm sure that, you know, um, uh, until you've been, until you've, you've kind of used it and not used it and used it and not used it, probably I would have also thought at the beginning, that's just ridiculous, it's nonsense. It's, you know, you think it sounds better because you've paid, you know, two grand for a box that doesn't do anything. But it actually, <laughs> but it actually really does. And the, these are absolutely fantastic as well. These new um, Neve kind of recreations, but they're, they're the, uh, you know, the, the lunchbox versions. Oh, yeah. And these are things I've not seen before, the UTA, the TG and the Shelford. Right, so yes, so these are, uh, these are things actually, these three are things that are new to this studio. So um, they've not been used on a lot of stuff yet. Um, but this is uh, undertone audio, um, makes some amazing bits of kit and I've been looking at their stuff for a while. It's really interesting because you, you download examples that people put online and listen to the differences between the different mic pre's. And I think, it, I think basically it's a little bit like being a chef and having just a different kind of spices that you can put on things. Yeah. And they all do, they're all really, really beautifully designed and built pieces of kit. And they all do things slightly differently. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that, that once I start, start recording stuff in here that I'm going to be experimenting with is because it's so easy now for me to just patch between different things, you know, and, and just try them out and see what, uh, what, for me, what works best. What someone brought my attention to is, is matching the mic to the mic pre as well. Yes. Which is something I've never thought of. Yeah, that's a whole thing as well. Yeah, I've, um, I've started reading about that as well. Um, that is interesting. I mean, the, the thing is, there are so many different variables that uh, that you can change and to see what kind of sound you get out. But um, it's going to it's a kind of a it's going to be a bit of an experimentation. These are the things that I know the least in the studio. Right. Um, they're, the, they're the stuff that I've used the least. So does that I mean, I think for me, that's what's quite fun about having a, a channel, because it actually I think it's a it's a motivator to do these experiments and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, you just feel you're kind of <laughs> nobbing around. But <laughs> yeah. actually, if you're creating some kind of useful content, that's... Uh... Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. My approach to um, recording stuff on a actual music uh, when I'm recording a part into Pro Tools or into Logic, usually into Pro Tools for me, because Pro Tools is more my tape deck. Um, I'm really uh, not an, uh, a person who says, oh, you have to record it in completely clean. I like to record it in with something on it. Mm -hmm. So uh, just EQ it a little bit, compress yeah, it a little bit, and make it sound good so that when I'm actually playing it, yeah. I'm excited by what I'm hearing. <laughs> but also, you know, I mean, a touch of compression to tape, say, on a piano means that you, you will adjust your performance, you know, yeah. slightly, as opposed to just going, oh my God, the way that compressor is dealing with, or to play it differently. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. That's great. Yeah. And then over here, some fancy... Yes. Oh, so now hang on a minute, this. This is, this is great. So this okay. is really important. This is a big design feature for me because I wanted to be able to do more of this. Right. And Amazing. so this was basically, I can get rid of the computer, I can sit here and I can ha I have somewhere that I can turn away from the door. So get out of that headspace and into a different headspace of actually writing stuff down on score paper. And, you know, listening to the idea that I've got in my head and putting it down on a piece of paper separately. And then when I've finished that process, I can turn back around again, go back to the computer and start playing stuff in. So for me, this, you know, the guys who designed the, this credenza couldn't quite understand why I wanted to sacrifice, you know, a whole rack of gear for somewhere to put my legs. But actually I've used it already to write in and it, I've, it's, it's worked as well as I hoped it would. It's, it's very interesting because uh, Eric Whitaker was telling me that um, he couldn't write at the piano because he always found that his fingers found the same shapes and were limited to his keyboard skills. Yeah. And therefore, uh, where he really discovers stuff is by actually writing it down. This is not a skill that I, I possess, but w why do you think this is advantageous to your workflow or a, a new adoption in, um, within your workflow? Well, it's, it's kind of for that reason. It's, it, I find it... Um, for, liberates me from my ability at the keyboard. It's exactly the same. 
And the Eric ability said. of the samples. And the ability of the samples, yeah. So then instead of, there's a real temptation always to kind of write to the samples and there's this whole thing that everyone talks about. Oh, you know, well, you can only write to the samples. But do you know what? We used to write stuff with a Proteus too. Yeah. And we didn't write to the Proteus because no, it no, always sounded crap. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, but the thing is, if you write stuff idiomatically, even if you're playing it with a Proteus 2, some of those, some of the demos on these things, I remember the Corgo 1 had a bunch of demos programmed into it by a um, Japanese composer. I can't remember who wrote the main one, um, but it was insanely good. And it was just because it was that thing about, you know, following an idea right, right the way through to completion. It's, it's not kind of getting to a certain point and going, no, oh, I can't really make it sound good. You have to finish it. You have to get to the end. And yes. then you'll know whether it sounds good. But if you've only half done it, then, you know. And surely also that something that has happened since we've become, you know, composers, arrangers, orchestrators, producers, engineers, is that, that, that you can skip a step. And whereas actually the, app, the, the act and art of composing is very different to, to that of putting stuff to picture, yeah. arranging, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. So that one is, is pre's. Um, and then this one is kind of EQs and compressors. And these are vintage, uh, so these 550s, which are, you know, the API 550, it's kind of familiar sound to anyone who's used even the plugins of these. Um, this is actually an APSI 559. It looks like an API 560, and that's because for some reason they licensed out the guy who was making them for them, they let him make his own version, I think, or some, I, mm -hmm. there's some kind of story behind it, but it's essentially the same thing. Um, these are uh, Neve compressors, um, diode bridge compressors, and they're really great. They've got a different flavor to this uh, Shadow Hills Mono Optograph, um, which, has, which is just a, like a kind of squeeze box compressor. It's just like a super characterful, right. um, it's mono. It's not uh, not a stereo, although it takes up two spaces. Um, and then this is a, uh, a double wide compressor, so it's got a kind of like a you can link double compression into the sound. Um, again, it's just a different character, a different flavour of compression. Um, these bad boys, I know you're very familiar with. Yes. <laughs> Distress. And how would you describe them? You can see, you can see I've got it set to nuke. Always, because the lights are blue. <laughs> um, yeah, that's the kind of go faster stripe of the compressor world, isn't it? Um, so they, yeah, they're, I mean, they're just fantastic. You can use them for just a tiny bit of warmth on stuff and then just use them to absolutely destroy and obliterate everything that's coming Great in. Great for drums, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. So those are fab. And this was, a, this was one of those funny gear accidents. I actually ordered one and two arrived by accident. And, um, <laughs> and once I'd got them sat there, I was like, oh God, how can I make this work? How can I work out how I can pay for the other one? Because once I'd tried them in stereo, I was like, oh dear. I should have just left the other box unopened. That would have been the sensible thing to do. Um, the saturator I've had for a while now. Um, that's kind of a different flavor from the, from the distressors, but it's a, it's a um, again, it's a kind of saturation tool. Um, surprisingly good on orchestral instruments. Okay. Uh, yeah, really interesting. A little bit, you can obviously go fairly aggressive on it, but it's a little bit, mild, it's a little bit of a warmer, gentler thing than the distressors. Um, so then we come over to here. So this is, this is the danger zone here. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that's, the, uh, that's the really worst part of the studio that I really need to stay away from. But because here, you may fill it. <laughs> because I may fill it. But um, yeah, but I'm, I'm, luckily I'm, I'm resisting temptation at the moment. This I've had for Get some blanking, get some more blankings in. <laughs> yeah, just that come really out. will help. That's <laughs> like, like studio condoms, aren't they? <laughs> Oh, I love it, yeah. Um, okay, so here we go. So this is uh, classic 1176. I've had this uh, for quite a long time. So I, when I, I had a programming room at Roundhouse Studios uh, in Farringdon, um, and they were closing down the studio and 
I got the opportunity to buy one of their, they had, I think they had four of them. I got the opportunity to buy one of these um, and it's just absolutely brilliant. I really, really love it. I mean, I use it a lot. Um, I don't know what to say. It's, it's just incredible. It's got this function, uh, you've got your four ratios, which all sound great. And then there's this mad function where if you push all the buttons in, it goes absolutely thermonuclear. So, oh wow. That's, um, that's actually the kind of, that is the classic sound um, that you associate with, um, oh God, who, what the, the two guys who wear helmets? Daft Punk. Daft Punk. Oh wow. Yeah. That's the classic sound that you associate with that kind of Daft Punk, you know, really uh, heavily compressed um, stuff. It's just fabulous for that kind of thing. Really, really great. And then this is a kind of, um, I'm going to get this wrong. I mean, it's called a 176 and I guess it has a vague similarity yeah. <laughs> to the 176, but it does have, um, it does kind of, have a few extra functions and I, it just sounds a little bit different so right and on to uh, and on. Really, i just have to show that, that basically because I, I i tend to be a bit of an atheist when you were setting up your cameras you said how does this and uh, your camera position is here yeah and you said how does this position look and i said that back wall's a bit blank and you filled it with a massive <laughs> tape machine <laughs> well yes uh, I mean, it's something worth saying that we actually do record pretty much all of the Spitfire libraries to tape. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's something that's... This is something that I just never thought I would be able to have. And, you know, I kind of grew up, I cut my teeth recording everything to tape every day. I mean, I would be filling tape every day. And so it was just the recording medium when I started my career. So but they've become so unbelievably expensive. And also this, getting this in here from the place that I bought it from was no mean feat and required four of us, strong young lads, well, maybe the others all stronger than I, but we, we basically had our whole weight against it. And, and the stairs outside, we had a kind of um, series of kind of wood panels on the stairs and we just, we, it, we just rolled it very, very carefully off the van, down the wood panels, onto the ground, and then again, up a ramp and down a ramp to get it. It's unliftable. I think it's, it's something insane, like 300 kilograms. Wow. Is that right? And did you and have to have it kind of serviced and stuff? So it's been very well maintained. The studio that it was at before, um, it was maintained by Tim Walker, who, as luck would have it, um, Tim and Robin Leggett also uh, came and worked, you know, on the, and did an incredible job on all of the wiring, cabling and testing of all the gear in here. So Tim knows this machine and has been here um, and kind of got it set up and he's lined it up. There's one, I have one thing which we have to fix on it, um, which is this curious piece of what looks like kind of rubber. Uh, <laughs> and once that is, is fixed, which hopefully will be quite soon, then it'll be up and running and I'll be um, recording stuff to tape in here. Amazing. So, and what I also love is that it was once owned by Central TV, which is the television station of the Midlands where I grew up watching <laughs> ITV. Fantastic. <laughs> you got some reampy stuff going on here. Yeah, so ampy and reampy. So the idea over here is that um, you turn everything on with one quick and easy switch, then Guitar goes in here, or if you're reamping stuff, you can take it from the patch bay at the bottom. Um, there's actually a kind of direct feed down here, so you wouldn't have to do that. But uh, I can plug my guitar in, I can pick the amp. Uh, I've only got one cabinet, which is this beautiful Vox AC30 cab, um, which sounds amazing. And then the, the idea is that the, you've got the Vox sound from the AC30 amp head. I've got the, this Laney is a kind of cleaner, more modern sound. Um, and kind of gets hey, kind of really heavy quite easily. Um, this lovely thing, Wallace Amplifier Co, is a little company that was based in Soho um, and made a certain number of these. This is a great bass amp head, so um, that's my kind of main thing for bass stuff going through. And then the Kemper here is, um, again, a kind of 
virtual, but it's a, it's, it's, it captures profiles. It's a profiler, so it captures a, a kind of, I, I don't know how it does it. It's very, very clever. It captures a kind of impulse response of a set of gear. Um, and then where this uh, comes into its own for me is that there are loads of really clever people um, uploading their profiles oh, wow. online. And so you can put stuff in there and it really sounds incredible. So between, so for the, for the real stuff, I love to have stuff coming out of the, out of the, the cabinet. Um, but for the kind of virtual stuff, I don't use any plug-in stuff. All of the virtual guitar stuff that I do is either going through the Kemper or going through the, um, the Helix, the Line 6 Helix over there. Wow. So I see you've got ties pretty much all around the room. Yes, so everywhere where there's going to be something. So there's, there's basically the guitar stuff over there. Here is piano and other assorted um, instruments. Uh, and that, yeah, that's, um, that, it's just to kind of make, make it so that there are fewer cables going across the floor. Um, Excellent. So that was all planned out. Everything comes up on the patch bay, so nice and easy. Um, but yeah, love, 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 love the piano. It's, um, it's, it's a beautiful C3. So it's quite bright. But you can always take that off and yeah. you'll recognize this. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's, I'm just kind of, again, getting my head around this incredible invention. Um, Keysense, which uh, Olafur sold to me. Um, and I'm going to be drilling other, other nutters and to other, some other nutters, and so I'm going to be drilling tips out of you for that. <laughs> and maybe what we could come to rest on is is um, uh, oh ooh, look, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, is that's... That, is that a new thing? No, no, I've had that for seven years. I've used it on one job, which was Little Big Planet Three where there's a section of the, of the uh, game where basically things are starting to disintegrate and everything's going mad and he's lost his mind and he's floating in, in chaos in space. And this was able to reproduce that sound very well because I have no idea how to work it. So I just pushed buttons until it started making uncontrollable, burbling, mad synth noises. And then uh, you've got you know, a couple of weird controllers here that you can use. It's so insanely complicated that you can see I haven't racked it up because I don't really know what to do. I don't know whether to set it up and try and, and try and, but there's so many things to learn. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to pick your battles, I suppose, don't you? So I don't know whether I'm, I don't know whether I'm gonna get to that or whether this, you know, if something, if something isn't getting used, I will sell it and, and okay. try and make sure that I don't, you know, because somebody, somebody would love and use this. Yeah, um, and maybe that's me, but maybe it isn't. And if it isn't, then I'll, then I'll sell it. And so stuff is earning its keep. My kind of default, I love Sherp's mics. Oh, yes. I'm, I'm kind of often, so I've used a, a 414 for lots and lots of things forever. Um, and at the moment, I don't have one because I tended up at Spitfire. So, right. so I've become more of a kind of small diaphragm than large diaphragm. So I've got quite a selection of bits and bobs. I've got these um, lovely 452s, which I'm gonna stick on the piano and have a go with those. I've, got, I've had this one for a long time, 451, four, uh, but I've only got one of those. This little bad boy is the KM84. <laughs> Um, Wonderful vintage, which is a it's which is a fantastic. Non vintage one eight fours are great, but the vintage are just great. Yeah, um, this wow. fantastic bass drum mic. It's one of those weird things where um, it just sounds incredible, but it's just one. Of the, it's just you know an old um, old design. Um, the capsules that I am using on my Sherps are the MK twenty ones, but I've had various different capsules kind of switched around. I had a set of mics that we were using um, for Spitfire, so I've those have ended up at Spitfire now. And I, these are the things, these are the ones that I use the most, the 20 ones, so that's what I've gone for here. Um, then, so th those all stick up 
for anything. I mean, I'll put those up for those recording. Are like yeah. people would use four and fours and that kind exactly, of thing. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Guitar, uh, piano, you know, drum overheads, whatever. Um, this is... Uh, I've used one of these a lot. Oh, they're um, great. Yeah. But actually is this... Is this the stereo? No, but this one I haven't actually used uh, yet. So this is a uh, Royal Ribbon, Active Ribbon 122. It's, I haven't actually used this one yet um, because I haven't, you know, I've been in a small room while this place right. was being built. So it just stayed in its case. Um, but again, it's a mic that I've used loads, well, the 121 I've used loads uh, on guitar cabinets. Um, it's an amazing sound and actually, um, I think it was Leo Abrahams who, who turned me on to using this on guitar. And one of his tips uh, was always angle it slightly at the cabinet, right. because if you have it flat on and you get a sudden low frequency, it slightly. <laughs> yeah, it just whoosh, tears the ribbon. So that's fantastic, love, love that. The legendary Colin and Les have given us this beautiful piece of equipment. 4038, Coles 4038, the original BBC presenter mic, BBC patents number. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the reason yeah. we, we never go barefoot in our studios. <laughs> Drop that in your toe. <laughs> yeah, you know about it. It's spectacularly heavy. I think it's very, very important to say, though, you don't need any of this. No. <laughs> no. So I've been working... Um, a lot of this gear has been in storage for, mm -hmm. I don't know, uh, certainly a, a year and a half, two years while I've been working in tiny little room. In I the want house. to correct myself. It's not you don't need it, it's it one doesn't one need. One doesn't need, no. They, I think that there's, um, you know, you can, there, you can get stuff um, and stuff can inspire you to do things. Mm -hmm. But it might be something as ridiculous as, for example, you know, this is a uh, this is a toy that was once yeah. rattled by one of my children when they were a baby, and this as well. And it can be something like that that costs you know fifty p or something, or you know a very very expensive ribbon mic. And the other thing to say is actually that there um, there are some great mics now that are nothing like as expensive as some of these, um, but are you know. In many ways, Paul's just done as a good. Video down below about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's definitely possible to get, you know, to without breaking the bank, to get a couple of mics set up and start recording things. But the things, you know, that I love in here, that um, like my clarinet that I've had since I was a teenager, mm -hmm. you know, that um, I still play on stuff, and just little fun bits of gear. You know, you can have as much fun with a couple of, you know a couple of new kind of soft beaters for a cymbal Absolutely. and just stick a cymbal up and play that over your track and, you know, you don't need loads and loads of gear. It's about, I mean, just it, this space embodies somewhere that's just excellent to work, that gives us... I mean, the thing I always say, like, you know, people go, you know, why don't you mix on NS10s? It's like, because it's got to be fun. <laughs> You yeah. know, we spend many, many yeah. hours in here, and I guess it's, yeah. it's about it being fun. Yeah. There's a degree of affirmation, if I don't mind, I, well, certainly for me, about, yeah. you know, I've achieved certain things, and this is a dream for me. And a fast track to being original and being inspired, I think, is, is, is a great, you know, uh, privilege of, of being able to, yeah. you know, have this kind of surroundings. But it's been built up over decades. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, and I've worked for a long, long time with nothing like this stuff. Um, but what I've tried to do is obviously, you know, make sure you're paying the rent, <laughs> make yeah. sure that your family, that your kids have food in their bellies and that you, you know, your family is safe. Um, but then when I've got a job, you know, instead of buying myself a Rolex or whatever, or a fast car, um, I've used a little bit of that money to invest in something, whether it's just a guitar pedal, you know, um, or whether it was at one stage, it was my drum kit, mm -hmm. and then just add little pieces on. And over the years, you know, you will build up, you know, like I was saying when we were over at the Voyager, um, if, I've, if I've got something that, you know, I've spent, a, that, I mean, the Voyager was thousands of pounds. Mm -hmm. um, and if I can't get my head around it, then I will, 
I will part exchange it or I'll sell it to somebody who who can understand it and then and that will give me some funds to you know it's it's an interesting point you bring up because I've been doing some gear reviews on on my channel and I've talked about resale value and people have been saying you you don't buy equipment for its resale value and I just for me, what I find really worrying about that is, is, is it's evidence of people not treating their business like a business. Yeah. So it's about the return, the, the personal return. I mean, I know there's equipment that I've got that I haven't used for years, but I know there was one job where I just absolutely caned it and it became yeah. the sound of a job. Yeah. So that's a, a good return. Yeah. But also just to buy something knowing that it would be worthless the minute you get out of the box just strikes me as being... <laughs> yeah, that's... Yeah. That, and, it, and it is difficult because, you know, I've bought stuff that was kind of, you know, a cheap copy of the thing that I really wanted and uh, because that was all I could afford. Yeah. And what I really should have done is just waited and yeah. maybe the following year I would have been able to buy the thing that I really wanted. And it just, you know, this, the stuff which has the name, you know, the EMI stuff, the Neve stuff, the... It's not just, you're not paying for a name, you're paying for a, a sound and a kind of design aesthetic that's gone, been successfully used for many, many years because this stuff sounds good. And nice. it, it's always, you're always gonna be able to resell it. So, you know, I mean, like I say, I've got a lot of secondhand gear in here. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, it's, I'm perfectly happy to buy stuff. Um, and a lot of stuff is, is, is fine to buy. I mean, I, what's amazing is the Mooga Fugas have appreciated in value so, Enormously yeah, that's crazy. Since since you can't buy them anymore, they're, more, so. they're worth more, like yeah. sometimes three times the amount than, than yeah. they were originally. Yeah, I nice. have one last very impossible question for you. <laughs> um, you're we're we're close to Wales here, and Wales is giant country. Yeah, if you were to hear a giant, like is his name Odin or something, a giant kind of tramping <laughs> across the Brecon beacons, making a clear pathway to this studio, the Bull Barn, <laughs> and you knew it was going to be crumpled within minutes, what single piece of kit would you take? The reason I, I did that and not like it's burning down because I just didn't want to tempt fate and I think that a giant <laughs> may not come <laughs> and squash the yeah. studio. Oh, oh my God, that's a really good question. What would I take, what would I take, what would I take? Oh. Your children are taking your, your drives, so that's fine. Yeah, so I don't have to so worry about no, nothing about IP. Like that. <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, Hannah's taking your award and the picture of your family. Okay. So... You can't, <laughs> take, you can't take your studio, I don't think. Do you know what? It's going to be a really... It's going to be a really... Uh, it's going to be a really boring answer. I would take my clarinet. That's great. I, it's, a, it's a Boozy and Hawks Symphony 1010. And I've been playing it since I was 13 or something like that. And I did my grade eight on it. And, and it just, I think that if the piano was portable, there might be a bit of a scrap to be had between the clarinet and the piano. But I think that I could sit in the smoking rubble of my <laughs> post. No, the crushed. Oh, sorry. It's not ten Okay. <laughs> the crushed rubble of my uh, of my destroyed studio, and and actually play a mournful melody out on the clarinet, and brilliant. I'd stuff. still be making music. Well, congratulations, mate. <laughs> this is a wonderful space. Thank you brilliant. very much. Nice. Cheers. Mate. Excellent. I'm not at all jealous. Anyway, Paul's going to be here tomorrow night, 1700 hours GMT, and I'm sure you have a lot of questions to ask him. So do join the live stream tomorrow night to fire him off some questions about his choices he's made with his studio. I think it's worth pointing out that Paul created this amazing collection of instruments over the last 20, 25 years. And as he said, you know, a lot, lot of being in storage and all of that kind of stuff. Very successful composer is Paul, and I look forward to watching his output from this place. I think it's great for the community. That there's yet another kind of studio where he will be um, creating tutorials and all of that kind of stuff, because I really value his very kind of theoretical approach to things. So tomorrow night is going to be the last live stream for Black Friday or Black Weekend rather, and uh, so therefore we'll be kind of rounding up the year 
talking about the highs and there are a couple of lows that we want to talk about so join us for that and you know this is your last opportunity to to grab these great deals of which i mentioned earlier the black weekend collection that will also qualify you for aperture which has been enjoyed by thousands of people who are really kind of saying that, that you know whilst we thought it was kind of quite a whimsical bit of fun it is actually a great way of working with string samples and all of that so i hope to see you tomorrow december the third uh, the, the uh, black weekend ends at um it's 2359 specifically gmt on the third of december but let's see you before then 1700 hours gmt back here on the spitfire channels tomorrow thanks for watching and see you then